All right, guys, what's up? Back here at Southeastern 14 with Max Barr, and uh, we are going to share our thoughts on Tennessee advancing to the Sweet 16. They're the only SEC team in action on Saturday, and, of course, we have two teams in action on Sunday, Alabama and Texas A&M. We've previewed those games in separate videos, which you can check out here on the channel, but we'll talk about them a little bit more before we uh, hop off here just to give some kind of final thoughts on those two games. Before we do that, let me tell you about our friends at Bet Online. The tournament is here. Bet Online, your bracket headquarters for the season. Uh, best bracket contest out there. Odds, lines, info, every game, every round, right up until the national championship. Of course, don't take bracket advice from us because um, Max and I, <laughs> our bracket has just been toast from day one. Go but, on. Go on. You can access the most uh, up to the minute wagering information anytime from your desktop or mobile devices. And even track your bracket in real time all the way through the tournament. So head on over to Bet Online today. Get in on the action. Use that promo code Believe B L E A V for your fifty percent off a welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online. The game starts here. All right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, is this the Rick's got it right here. Okay. Yep. Tennessee just win. That's yep. all you got to do. Everyone advances to the Sweet Sixteen the same. You don't get extra style points. You don't get to get reseeded based on how you play in the second round. Um. It's it's a tournament, and so it was not pretty for the Vols. Uh, they went at 62-58 over Texas, and I thought the biggest development in this game was, look, Dalton Connect still scored 18 points, and I know Max was there live, and you know he's probably just watching this game and trying to figure out exactly how this thing's going to play out as it's going along. It's like, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen here? But Connect scores 18. It was not his best game. He went 5-18 from the field. Um, you know, scored, what, seven of those from the free throw line. He did pick up nine rebounds. Um, but, like, this to me proved that Tennessee, if this is going to be a year where they're able to just keep going and keep going and keep going, like, their defense is good enough to kind of carry them. And for them to win an NCAA tournament game like this, where their offense was absolutely atrocious at times, um, where they're just not hitting shots, three of 25 from three, they shot, whatever, 30-something percent from the field. You'll take it. Any way you can get it, you'll take it, and that's all that matters. So, this I like what I like what Connie said up here. It's a long comment, but it's it, it rings true. Age 10 years last night, I feel I feel you. I feel you. The energy in the Spectrum Center, it was like a a nervous energy the whole time. I'll tell you what. I have never seen fans stand for so long in a game. I mean, like there was like obviously like during halftime or if it was like the long, long media timeout, some of the Tennessee fans sat down. Well, other than that, they stood the entire game. Um, and it was it was cool because Tennessee was on one corner and then the opposite corner was Texas. So they were just like screaming back and forth at each other um, as like the momentum swung back and forth. Um, but this is exactly the type of game Tennessee normally loses the bad shooting night that you go through offensive slumps, uh, Ziegler and connect combined for seven turnovers. This was the game they would usually drop. Not this year, not this year. I thought Tobe Awaka, I know he picked up the fouls. I know he picked up the fouls. He actually, in his post game, he said that he, uh, he asked Barnes on the bench, can I go back in the game? You trust me. And he had two. Barnes thought he had one and put him back in. And then he picks up his third in the first half. Um, but he still got the Ken Palm MVP on the game, did a, did a walk. Uh, only in 11 minutes, he gets 10 points, five rebounds, four offensive rebounds, a block. I mean, it's so nice to have that off the bench. Um, but just – we were there, right? And the last about four minutes, Blake, we have all these. So it's it's the last it's the last session of the whole the whole weekend, and so most of the UNC fans who were there had already left. Everyone just floods down to like the, they no seats anymore. Everyone just floods down. All Tennessee fans, we're going nuts, and then Tyrese Hunter hits a three, yeah. and we're like, oh no, you got to be kidding me! We just got roped all the way back. Um, but hey, a win is a win. You'll take it any way you can get it onto the sweet 16. And now you're going to catch a team. I know you have almost 
you know, more than half a week off here. But now you're catching a team that just basically ran a marathon and tough mutter in one night. So not a bad setup. Yeah, we'll talk about that matchup a little bit uh, before we we move on from Tennessee. But like, I, I just you said it. I mean, that was the the biggest development I thought was just the fact that they could win a game like this because that was always the question: Are they got it done? Can they win a game like this when they aren't making shots? And I think you're starting to, you know, you're having flashbacks as this game is going on. You're thinking this is exactly what's going to happen. Tennessee is not going to be able to score for X amount of minutes. Texas all of a sudden going to start hitting a couple of shots and that's it, but it didn't yep. happen. And again, I think there's just credit to what they can do defensively. Like you said, a guy getting Ken Palm MVP playing 11 minutes. Um, that's a pretty productive, productive night for Toby yeah. Iwaka. Uh, so yeah. And you know, as we said, going into the season, he was kind of our, you know, remember like back in the summer, everybody's this guy's he's getting there. Like he's mm-hmm. about to be this, you know, breakout star and, um, you know, I, I would say the numbers maybe didn't quite reach that level consistently this season, but still, I mean, it's, it's nice to have a guy like that in a game like this, where you, you do have someone who can just be the difference maker. If some of your other guys are not making their usual plays. And you know, I thought Jonas, they do made some big plays down the stretch for sure. Um, and you know, too, I mean, look, we've seen games in the NCAA tournament where if you miss free throws, Right, yeah. like that can be what costs you. And luckily, Tennessee hits enough here to win. They go fifteen to eighteen, but again, some of those were just big ones down the stretch. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I what scared us about Texas was really, I mean, again, sort of the the big three guys who had the majority of their points, even though they only scored fifty eight as a team. But we knew that Tennessee, and there were look Tennessee forced some of those turnovers in the first half, but some of them were just. Texas making some careless plays yeah. and and that beats you though and this time you know survive in advance it beats you when you make some of those turnovers and you can't get them back so um yeah it was it was big for the Vols and I just I mean look I, I just I can't get over the fact that they just won an NCAA tournament game going three of 25 from three and shooting the ball as poorly as they did but like now I'm almost I mentioned the voodoo if they can get beyond this, where they shoot this poorly and win an NCAA tournament game, when that's all any of us have talked about for the past however many years now, just just take them on to the to the Final Four. Just just push them on out there because that's the only explanation I got. I'll tell you what. One of my favorite uh, quotes from the post game was Rodney Terry actually, and he called he called Ziegler a little guy. He knows he knows his name, um, but he was like the little guy's the head of the snake. Make no mistake about it. That's that's who runs the show for this team. Um, and I didn't really – I always knew that, but up close and personal seeing it when the game was on the line, uh, say they get a defensive rebound and they kind of have a chance to to push up. Everyone is like, no, 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 no. Get it back to Ziegler. Get it back to Ziegler. No, 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 no. Don't do anything. No. Um, <laughs> someone say they had a Biden. <laughs> hey. I don't blame you. Like I understand. I can listen. I can imagine as a Tennessee fan because you know it's not just us that's it. Like right, we we haven't just been the ones who talked about this. It's just we, that was the thing, right? Like all right, the difference this year is that Dalton Connect is going to get him out of some of these scoring issues, right? Like, and again, he's still that's what that's the thing about Dalton Connect. He scored 18 points in this game, all right? And you're looking around thinking this was not one of his better performances. And yet, no. like, this is what he can do. Like, he can still affect the game in a big way, even if he's not going out and scoring 40. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, and I think, too, that's something else, right? It's the defensive. Teams have to now defend Tennessee differently. And even yep. though they didn't make – the team as a whole didn't necessarily make them pay because of how they defended them here, when you have Dalton Connect on the floor, floor you got to defend in a way where you're going to give other guys an opportunity. And it's just a matter of can guys hit shots? No, they didn't do it consistently here. But again, it was still enough, and that's all that matters. So, yeah, Ziegler's had at least seven assists in four of his last five games. I mean, he's on a he's on a roll. Um, and if, when you look at when you just look at the box score or even immediate reaction just from watching the game, you would you would think like, man, Zeeg's and Vescovy had an off night. Man, they they didn't. They did not shoot the ball that well. Well, while that may be true, 
they also combined for six steals, six live six live ball steals. Yeah, that 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 obviously then in turn led to a advantageous offensive possession, six of them. Right, so maybe yes, they did have an off night shooting, but that's why that's why you're seeing Z's with 40 minutes not coming off the floor because of because of stuff like that. Well, I don't know what else we can say about that game because I think it was just kind of like, you know, I mean, they won the game, they grinded it out. That's the kind of wins you want in March. But we'll go ahead and just quickly give some thoughts on the Creighton matchup, uh, and oh, yeah. of course, as always, we will. We'll do our preview video. We'll give you our prediction, all that. For anyone who thought the Southeastern 14 kiss of death was going to play a role here, it did not. We all we took care of business uh, against Texas. By the way, the next basketball game Texas plays will be uh, as an SEC member. So we'll see them next season. But for now, Tennessee gets Creighton. That was a wild game. I hope you guys stayed up and watched that one because that was – maybe the game of the tournament so far uh, yeah. with Creighton and Oregon. And I'll be honest, Max, I'm, I'm looking at this, and the more I watch this game, now you guys remember what I said and why I advanced Creighton on in my bracket before we got into this tournament. Um, you know, I said I just didn't love the matchup. But I don't know. The more I watched Oregon, I'm like, I wonder if Oregon's the worst matchup for Tennessee <laughs> uh, based on how Kuznard's been playing. You know, you've got the big man in Dante. We've talked about kind of Tennessee struggles at times with teams like that. Um but, look, Creighton winds up winning this game for a reason. Oregon just sort of ran out of gas. Creighton just kept hitting shots. And I think what would scare me the most, not just that they have, obviously, a good big man inside with Kaufbrenner, who had 19 and 14 in this game, had five blocks, too, by the way. Uh, but they've just got a lot of guys who can make big shots. And we saw that, like, you know, Ashworth hit some big shots in that game. Alexander, Shireman, they go 15 of 39 from three. So, it's kind of just like bombs away for Creighton, and that's what they had to do to win this game. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, in the comments, like, I'm not going to lie. As I'm watching it, I, I I did start to think, man, I think Oregon's the worst matchup for Tennessee. And now that I kind of see it, I, I think the defense here is where I'm not as maybe concerned for Tennessee as I thought I would be because, now, look, Tennessee's not going to be able to go 3-25 of and beat Creighton. I'm just going to tell you right now <laughs> that's not going to happen. But again, I don't know that we necessarily see that, um, and so, yeah, I, I'm I'm curious to see how this thing unfolds. And again, we'll make our predictions and give a full preview and stuff. But first glance, I don't hate it as much as I did before the tournament started. No, and it's it's going to come down to, well, it's not going to come down to, but a very important piece of that game is going to be Tennessee's mid range. Um, they play that drop coverage with Kalkbrenner. He does not foul. I'm pretty sure Creighton's actually the number one, like, lack of following team in the in the yeah. night in the nation, defending without following. Um, they do not put you on the free throw line, um, and they also do not let you shoot threes. So it's gonna. I think we're gonna get a ton of uh, Dalton Connect mid range jumpers, um, kind of similar to how Creighton runs their offense. You can get. Shireman and Alexander and those mid-range jumpers. It's going to come down to who who can get to their spots and who can make open shots because both defenses are top 25 defenses. Tennessee is obviously going to be a little bit better. Um, but then on the flip side, Creighton's offense is going to be slightly more efficient. Um, I like the matchup between Ashworth and Ziegler. Those are two guys that just the ball's tipped. They start running, and they don't stop running until the game's over. Uh, that's going to be a great matchup. Two older guys, two older point guards. Um, yeah, the the Oregon matchup might be a little bit more intimidating from like a physicality standpoint just because Dante's playing like one of the best bigs I've seen in a long time. And Kusnard, geez, what did he just put up? 30-plus two straight games. Um, yeah. So while that might be a little bit more timid, intimidating on the surface, uh, this Creighton team is the eighth oldest team in the nation. You know, they're going to, they've been here knocking on the door, I think four straight years now. Um, so this is, this is going to be two coaches trying to break through kind of in similar positions. Um, but I do like that angle. How, I mean, geez, they just, if you were watching that game last night, if you didn't watch it, I've never seen so many possessions where the guys are just taking the first 20 seconds off kind of mutually on both on both teams because they're so gassed um 
they're going to have plenty of time to recover. Don't put too much into it, but I do like that angle about how they did just, geez, play a marathon game. Yeah, I mean, and too, it's like Creighton, talk about like, we'll break this down more in the matchup, but like it's the way they defend too. Like they're, I think they're, they force the fewest turnovers of any team. Um, in terms of like defensively, I could be wrong about that, but I'll have to look up the actual stuff. Three, four years now. Yeah, they're they're somewhere in that range. And so I think that is something too where Tennessee look if as we said in this tournament, if you don't beat yourself, that you're you're a step ahead when you get in these kind of survive and advance games. Um so yeah, I mean and, and I think that's that that's a nice spot to be in because you wanna feel like maybe you get a few more of those open shots, you you know, the, maybe you don't even get in this Texas game, and maybe that plays into it. But I'm going to look up the stat now because I'm interested to see. Uh, yeah, so 351, Creighton, they forced 7.71 turnovers per game. So 7.7 fewest in college basketball. So, yeah, that's that's a nice thing, I think, for Tennessee is I do feel like they'll be able to run their offense um, and at least get shots they want to get. And, of course, if that means Dalton Connect is – on and you're getting him the kind of shots he wants you're in good shape so um yeah i as we always say <laughs> trust me if anybody has learned this more than the sec the, the ncaa tournament is about matchups and i think this is where the more we dive into this one over the next couple of days i think we will we'll be able to find a, a pretty decent path for tennessee here uh, maybe more so than what we saw going into the the NCAA tournament so yeah should be a fun one Max I, I'm I'm looking forward to this one I, I think it will be there's a lot that I think Tennessee can do to to advance uh, in this game I'll just say that having just sort of initially looked at it as I'm watching that Creighton game last night and seeing that they're probably gonna win that one as it got to double OT so well the thing with Creighton is they're just like they have been in in past years. They are just super thin on that rotation. Colt yeah. Brenner is going to play. I know he does not foul much whatsoever, but he's going to play 100% of the minutes at center, 100%. Uh, Ashworth is going to play 90% of the minutes at point guard. They, and then they'll rotate between Trey Alexander, Shireman, and Farabello at the, at the two and the three. I mean, there's not much depth there. Uh, so I think with, with a full week, and how this defense just looked, um, as, as efficient as this Creighton offense is, I think there's a lot of stuff, especially with how Ziegler is so disruptive at the point guard and how much they use Ashworth and the dribble handoff, pick and roll with Kalk Brunner, all that. I think there's a lot that Tennessee is going to be able to do defensively, especially with Ziegler, to kind of stunt this Creighton offense. But just looking at it from the from first glance, it's two really old teams um, and two coaches that are trying to break through. So initially there's no, I'm not seeing any huge edge either side. Well, we'll break it down over the next couple of days, two teams who played tough schedules. And I think that, you know, certainly benefited them to help them get to this point. Um, you know, battle tested uh, when you get to the sweet 16. And so, uh, yeah, uh, Tennessee, Wins this one, Creighton. Two, two, two interesting games, two completely different games uh, for Tennessee and uh, Creighton in their second round matchups. But they advance the on. That already. What's that? We they got the odds are out already for this game. It's a uh, Tennessee minus two on early early release. Money line sounds is about minus right. Forty. So. Sounds about right. I was gonna say one and a half. Two that works. So yeah. there you go. Curious to see how that moves throughout the next uh, couple of days. But all right, we'll talk about that. Hit the, if you're a Tennessee fan joining for the first time, hit the subscribe button. We'll be previewing this like we have every single game throughout the season pretty much. Um, so, yeah. And now also we'll get into a little coaching stuff in a few minutes before we hop right. off too because things are nuts there uh, with the coaching carousel right now. But, again, we have already done previews on Alabama and Grand Canyon and Texas A&M Houston. But, uh, Max, any additional quick thoughts on these two matchups? Uh, we, you know, if you haven't watched the, the preview videos yet, uh, we both picked Alabama. I picked Houston. Max picked Texas A&M, which uh, I tend to be 
moving more towards his thought on this game because it does seem to set up pretty well for the Aggies here based on how they've been playing. Their offense has just been a machine, which is not something that I expected to say for Texas A&M, but uh, they have been on a roll offensively. Alabama, meanwhile, gets Grand Canyon, who, as Max pointed out, and I think could be the story of this game, has to prepare for two completely different teams in a span of you know 48 hours. They go from St. Mary's to Alabama. You could not maybe get further away in terms of uh, the way two teams want to play and win. So two two fascinating matchups here. But as we said in the previews, I, I think two very winnable games for the SEC uh, in these two spots. Now, the, the more I think about that Alabama Grand Canyon game, the more I'm buying into how tough that turnaround is from you're preparing for a week for St. Mary's. And then now you got to get a top five offense and top five pace just like not even remotely close. Um, and, and Brett's right. Less than 48 hours to prepare for Sam Walters. Um, Where's Tucker? Re- recipe for disaster for the opponent there. Um, once again, Alabama has the highest total of the, of the round. So that's two straight rounds where Alabama's got the highest total. This one's Take at 170, over. I believe. Might have gotten pushed down to 169. Yeah. Um, but anyways... If you're all, if you're in for entertainment, you, the odds are saying this one's going to be something like ninety to eighty, you know. Um, and then over to Houston A and M. Oh man, I am. I have gotten to the point where I first looked at this game and I was like, man, I think A and M's got some. They've got a chance to keep this thing close. And I've I've gotten myself all the way to the point where. In my mind, it's a and minus 10, not Houston minus 10. I've somehow transferred myself all the way to, yeah, a and going to win, no doubt about it, um, which is dangerous, which is dangerous. Dangerous. Um, but listen, for all of the, what's the right word? Unfortunate outcomes the SEC went through the first few days, still have an opportunity to get multiple teams to the Sweet 16. And I don't care what conference you're in. I don't care how many teams you get in. You got a chance for multiple teams to get to the Elite Eight. Uh, you're, you're doing something right. So big opportunity today. Um, I am, I'm also a, a SEC homer now, but I'm feeling confident we can get, we can get 2-0 here today. Confident. Now Max has become a bigger SEC homer than I am, and that's it's hard to do. But um, Someone's got to do it. Somebody's got to do it. So, yeah, Lucas, I mean, again, the Southeastern 14 Kiss of Death, it's March, all right? We don't we don't play that game, all right? We, we've told the uh, the Kiss of Death we don't play that game in March. So, uh, see you later. Um, yeah, Alabama, I, I told you, I, I look, I picked Michigan State to, to get to the Sweet 16. I thought maybe that would be the best path for Alabama to – get to the you know elite eight but the way things are setting up i you know you got to beat grand canyon first but um again if we said it if alabama's at full strength which they are now and they're shooting the ball well which they are and they defend a little bit which they did despite you know looking at the final score in that charleston game they're they're really good and they were good enough to win the sec that team was uh when you had everybody available and all that but obviously just kind of took a dip over the past month, uh, but yeah, if they play like that, they got a great chance to beat Grand Canyon and go on to have a very, you know, if you're ranking the Sweet 16 matchups, uh, that will be one of the higher ones out there based on the way those two teams like to play, uh, if that's what we get. And then a and i A&M, I- I'm ready to go full money line on the Aggies right now. Like, yep. Max is just talking yep. me into it. Give it a shot here. Let's see what happens. Um, but I mean, like we said, that somehow Texas A&M has become an offensive juggernaut. And it's almost like they're just completely defying the odds here because we just kept bringing up their shooting percentages and everything. And they're, they're going up and up and up uh, based on how they're scoring over the past little bit. So yeah, I need more teams in the sweet 16 from the sec. Uh, so got a I lot. And a Manny Obaski Jersey. Couldn't find one. Well, they probably sold out. So it's my guess. Probably probably sold out you've probably sent people out buying jerseys everywhere toby awake toby toby awake jersey is going to be going off the shelves after this live stream i would think you know so. what those halftime shows where they, they bring out the trampoline and the, the the 
they're doing like the trampoline dunks. That's what Manny Obaski does in real games. Just launches himself at the rim. No regard if he's going to make the shot or not. I love it. An absolute rocket. Uh, yeah. is One thing I wanted to Obaski. add, Blake, um, I'm really – I'm really looking forward to – I know we're just jumping around here, but I'm really looking That's forward to the matchup and how uh, – what Nate Oates does to stop Ty and Grant Foster. Probably the best perimeter defender for Alabama, Ryland Griffin, 6'6", Grant Foster, 6'7". I think he can handle it, um, but that's going to be interesting uh, because Grand Canyon's a rare team where that guy at the three – is their highest usage guy. 28.7% of possessions. Next highest is is 22.7. So kind of a unique setup where they run everything through the three, not the point guard. Um, I'll, and I think, I know as much as the Alabama defense has, has struggled, I think this kind of not sets up well for Alabama, but if you have Rylan Griffin on the highest usage guy, I think that's got to be something worth some value. Yep. Uh, big matchup. And I guess we, we also got breaking news here. Christian's headed to Los Angeles. If oh. Alabama wins, that could be dangerous for, for oh, LA. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens there with that. But all right. So like we said, if you want to check out our full previews, Alabama, Texas A&M games, you can do that on the channel. Uh, check out those videos. And like we mentioned as well, as always, we will have our Tennessee Creighton video up probably in the next day or so. Uh, we'd like to get those out early, especially when we've got a little time between games. So we'll start to break that matchup down, and uh, we will get that to you guys here in the next little bit uh, to start looking at that game. Uh, should be a lot of fun to really dive into that one and watch the Blue Jays uh, a bit and some different things and see what Tennessee can do to advance to the Elite Eight. But um, all right, Max, before we hop off. Yeah. Chaos. Chaos. The SEC coaching carousel could get very chaotic here as we we start to move in the next 24 hours or so. Um, it's usually what happens every year when you talk about kind of, you know, the situation where you get that second round over with and you're trying to, you know, really figure out who's going to go where and all this other stuff. And now you're kind of in a position where Things Dusty May is a big domino because we all yeah. thought he was heading to Louisville. That's not going to happen. He's at Michigan now. That was kind of the one a lot of people were waiting on. And, and I know people don't want to believe this, but you saw some of the national reports out there. Look, Vanderbilt legitimately thought that they were right there with a the chance um, to to get Dusty May. Um, and, and I think some people were like shocked by that. They're like, why would Vanderbilt ever think that they were going to get Dusty May? Dusty May. Well, when you put like an offer in, if you're going to, you know, extend an offer, that tells me you're not going out and extending offers to eight different coaches at the same time, right? Like you're going after this guy and making him tell you no. And so I think you got to give Vanderbilt some credit for that. At least they took a shot. They aimed high. If he was their first choice, like golf clap, because that's, that's a good job. If that's who you're going after, that tells me they're going after the right candidates. Um, but the Dusty May thing is going to make things interesting because um, now Louisville's open and yeah. they're obviously, I, I mean, look, there are certain SEC coaches that are Louisville is, I just think we're starting to see that. I don't know if Louisville is going to get necessarily the guy they, they think they're going to get, uh, which we know one of them's off the board already, but I, I think this is going to get kind of interesting because look, you've still got the stuff out there. Is Eric Musselman coming back? Is he not? Um, that's been hanging around for a little bit. I, I don't know that anything's completely changed there because the problem is when you have silence, you're just like, which way do you read that? Uh, you know, cause you, they're, they're coaches handle things in a different way. Schools handle things in a different way. Some guys just immediately come out and say, Hey, I know these rumors are swirling everywhere. I'll be back. Or then it just, it's radio silence and you have no idea. That's kind of the situation we're in right now. I feel like with a couple of these situations, obviously the John Calipari one, who knows what to believe? Because, I mean, as we said, after the Kentucky, whatever reaction we did on that, if if Kentucky wants a new coach, Kentucky's going to get a new coach. Um, and I think it's really as simple as that. They will pay the money. Everybody's acting like this whole buyout thing is a huge deal. It's not. Like, it's really not that big of a deal. 
Um, Andy Staples did a great video kind of explaining why, you know, Chris brought that up in the previous video. There are plenty of ways to offset that payment. You're not just paying this guy, whatever up front. That's not how it works. So I don't know. Um, it's we interesting, Max. Here. What do you what think we about got? Mother Carol. Um, yep. Shaheen Holloway or Pat Kelsey to Vandy or, and so the Holloway one is, I've seen that out there, kind of the I, connection. Yeah, I and your thoughts on that. <sighs> I mean, look, it's here's here's the era that we're in, right? It is really a matter of what is a coach going to get whenever he gets there. Like what NIL is like it dominates every decision now. Yep. Um it's not just what you're getting paid, it's what are you getting there to pay your players? Like what a what a wild sentence that is. Like That's think where about where we were 5 years ago, right? And now it's how much money are you going to get to pay your players? Um that's really what it comes down to. And so you would think Louisville's got plenty of money to do that. Um, and you would, you would hope that's the case. So I, I think that's kind of an interesting situation, but Pat Kelsey's the one that's just been kind of hanging out there. I, I feel like we're, we're getting close to Pat Kelsey getting another job, but um, you know, and people make, I think people sometimes max make a lot of, well, the guy just got beat in the first round. That don't, <laughs> A one game NCAA tournament can define your coaching career because, you know, if a guy wins a Sweet 16 game, right, and he's Cinderella, and all of a sudden you get a Shaheen Holloway who all of a sudden gets a bigger job and all that. But it doesn't just completely, one game isn't going to define what you've done throughout your entire career um, when you get to this point. So Pat Kelsey's a name that'll pop up, and we'll kind of see if he winds up wherever. Vanderbilt, it's, yeah, we'll, we'll see. So. Well, I think Bucky's in there also now. Yeah. I think Bucky McMillan would be a great hire for Vanderbilt. Um, I well, said last I night. McMillan, I'd be behind bars right now based on that, my reaction <laughs> to right. that, that block call. So tip my cap to Bucky for holding his composure because I wouldn't have. Well, I think Bucky, I, I said last night, I put the poll out on Twitter. I said, would you take Chris Mack and Bucky McMillan or the field right now if you were, you know, your, your yeah. prediction for Vanderbilt? I said, I would take the combination of either Mack or Bucky versus the field. I think that's probably where we are for Vanderbilt. Um, again, Pat Kelsey's an interesting name that's out there. I know people mentioned Josh Schertz at Indiana State, but it seems like St. Louis is the St. destination Lewis. there. And they're still playing, right? So until they lose, you're not going to get any forward movement on that because they're still in the NIT. Uh, yep. Indiana State is. So – you're not getting anything there. Um, but I think Vanderbilt will now move quicker because if they did have Dusty May, if that was their offer was to him, well, now he's off the board. you got to start moving quick. Because we said that the issue for Vanderbilt becomes if Kentucky makes a move, <clears throat> if this happens, it's going to happen soon if they do it. Like if they make this move, it's going to happen probably in the next 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. But that's also dependent on do they have their next guy ready? Because if they that's don't, well, then <laughs> – it's not going to happen quickly, and this thing could drag out. And so we said, too, if, if Kentucky makes a move, Vanderbilt better have a coach in place because the domino effect that that's going to create is going to be absurd because you are going to have then a lot of dominoes start to fall because that's the biggest one to me. Any job that could become available, Kentucky is the one where if that job is available and all of a sudden Coach A jumps here, Coach B jumps there, you just keep going and going and going. This thing lasts for weeks at that point. So, yeah. What did we? We'll what see. did we see? What, what was? What, 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 I feel like I saw something. It was like, um, as much as, as much as Kentucky, um, like is, is, not content with the current performances. That same level is like they don't. They need to be sure that the replacement is an upgrade. Yeah. You know, like it's like a two sided coin. It's like not only, like, yes, there's there is an urgency that we like the results are not up to our standards, but then you don't want to make a decision and take another step backwards, you yeah. know. So it's it's like a harder decision than the on the surface of just like we got to change. Like, well, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. You, you can't get rid of a guy just to get rid of a guy, yeah. <laughs> like that, especially if you're in Kentucky. That is not how it works. Um, you can be as frustrated as you want, but you can't get rid of a guy and just say, all right, well, let's go see what happens. You got to have the plan in place before you You're get there. You're just trying to hit the lottery at that point. 
Yeah. So, um, I've said, I just feel like Kentucky fans have reached the point of no return with Cal. I don't know how you could convince people that things are going to be different. Um, but that's the way it works. So, um, Christian spreading his propaganda. He wants Bruce Pearl to Louisville. It's not happening. Christian, I apologize. Shout out to, uh, Blueberry J here. One dollar ninety nine cent super hey. chat. Loves the channel. Hey, the balls advance. Hey, keep winning. Sweet 16. Keep winning. Keep winning. You'll keep loving the channel even more. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> let's see the other one here. Uh, the general is back. Uh, any other program Cal would be gone. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I mean, I, I just think it's, it, it look, it's complicated. The contract situation is complicated. Yes. We said they can work their way out of it, but, what did it's Trilly still... tweet? Someone asked. Someone asked Trilly like, "Oh hey, yeah, the... <laughs> Kentucky." And he posted a picture of the Facebook relationship status. Yeah. It's yeah. complicated. It's complicated. It is like it. It's a very complicated situation. Um, there you go, Sean. <laughs> this is a great one, Sean. Just hire two head coaches. So here here's what you do. It's kind of like the baseball starting pitcher and the closer. Like Cal coaches the regular season. And then if Kentucky fans are so frustrated with him, by the time you get to the NCAA tournament, just let somebody else coach the tournament. Like maybe, maybe that's what they should do. So, um, like a, yeah. like a two, like a three week contract. <laughs> oh, stranger things have happened in Kentucky basketball, but, uh, yeah. Anyways. All right, guys, we're going to do a two minute warning here. Max has got to hop off. Uh, he's going to travel back today. Uh, he's been at the action in Charlotte, as we said. So, um, any quick super chats you want to get in, we will have plenty more thoughts and videos on the coaching carousel. Obviously if Alabama and Texas A&M advance, we'll do some reaction tomorrow, uh, as well. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of fun stuff coming. We will keep our, again, keep your notifications on Twitter, uh, because I think you're going to get some coaching notifications over the next 24 hours or so, uh, based on the way some of this is moving right now, one way or the other, whether guys are back or whether you have coaching changes, at different SEC schools. So, um, anyways, there you go. Thoughts on that, uh, Max? Yeah, anything just to, else? Just to wrap up. Um, no, I was joking about it the past few days. The SEC, the SEC still hasn't lost a night game. Like mm, a little bit. True. I don't know how it's kind of falling this, falling out this way, but SEC when after that dark. goes down, we don't lose. What time does Texas A&M play? Oh, they play at 8.40 Eastern tonight. Oh, Alabama oh, plays 7.10 Eastern, I think. So, oh my gosh, now that you put it that way. Parlay? Alabama A&M parlay. <laughs> like, all in on these two. So I'm trying. Um, I'm trying. Trying. Well, we'll see what game times are for next. We know there'll be night games uh, in the Sweet 16. So that we know for sure um, because there aren't as many games. And so – Tennessee, you're already sitting in good shape for a night game. It's great, and we'll find out those game times, uh, I guess, late tonight, whenever though, yeah, right after the um, the other ones are finished. So, all right, guys. Well, Max got to hop off, so we're going to hop off here. Uh, we appreciate you watching. Uh, again, these 8 a.m. live streams have been a lot of fun. We had 400 people watching this thing, uh, which is tremendous. You guys awesome. are spending your morning here with us at Southeastern 14. Hit the subscribe button on the way out. Hit the like button as well. Uh, we'll and tomorrow. Yeah, I think we're probably going to do this tomorrow morning. Uh, yep. Same time, 8 a.m. Yep. live stream. So Monday morning, we're going to have some fun with it. And hopefully, we will have some coaching stuff to talk about because I think that will absolutely be the case. One way or the other, we're going to get some movement today, I think, on the coaching front. So um, we'll find out where things stand. But again, we appreciate Wait, you guys. Real quick, Wait, yeah. I just wanted to, I just want to let everyone know, like, guys, I know the a lot of teams are in off-season mode right now. Ha so is half of our brains. We're on the coaching trail. We're on the portal trail. It's it, it's not going to be. There's not going to be any off season here at Southeastern no. 14. It, we're going. We're we're rolling right into the off season. Some big portal names going to be out there, uh, from what we know. So uh, SEC, protect your guys because there's going to be some some portaling going on here. Soon enough, and like Max said, of course, we cover SEC football, SEC baseball here at Southeastern 14, but Max and I will be all in on basketball during the offseason. So you'll be getting lots of stuff from us. Um, and, again, I know some of you guys will maybe just check out, go to football, go to baseball. That's fine. Uh, support everything we do here at Southeastern 14. But, um, yeah, portal 
Portal Combat's about to get going, and Max and I will be doing multiple shows slash videos per week uh, with some thoughts on, uh, yeah, everything going on in we'll have you covered. We will have you covered. Guarantee it. We'll have you covered. So, again, appreciate you guys watching, and uh, we will talk to you again here tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. Central Reaction at Southeastern 14.